This episode of Scrolling to Death is sponsored by Bark Technologies. Bark offers parents advanced content monitoring for all of your child's devices. Bark is literally helping to save lives and has alerted parents to millions of life-threatening situations like self-harm and severe bullying. More on Bark in the episode notes. So, Ben Tracy, welcome to Scrolling to Death. Yeah, (laughs) thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so stoked to have you on. Uh, And for listeners, Ben is a leading keynote speaker in the online safety space, and you're doing something really crazy right now. So you're a little over halfway through, right? Tracy Track, halfway through? Yeah, over halfway through. Yep. Okay. So tell listeners about Tracy Track. So the Tracy Trek is a run across the United States. Um, so I'm doing a full marathon each day. So 26.2 miles each day for 120 days in a row. Um, we did take one day off just because we're ahead of schedule. Um, so I'm running, I'm currently right in the middle of my 66th marathon in the last 67 days. Um, and I feel good. And uh, like I said, the only reason that I took a break was just because we're, we're ahead of schedule. And so professionally, I go to schools and I speak to students and parents and educators about social media and online safety. And I've done that for the last six years or so. And so Mm -hmm. I'm speaking at groups along the way. And so it's a little bit of a logistical nightmare trying to coordinate the running while also speaking in in schools that are along the route and just trying to coordinate everything. So that's why I had to take the day off um, about six days ago, not the not anything physical. How are you organizing that? Like an app or like just a big piece of paper with like, like how is it? It's, how it's literally it? like, it's like a Google spreadsheet, you know, and, yeah. and we do, so we do the running in an app called Strava. We make the route for each day in Strava. And then, um, you know, we have it all mapped out and we know the towns that we're going to be going through. And it doesn't always work out perfectly where some days we'll have to go an hour ahead or an hour back or, mm-hmm. and so we'll just drive the RV there to, to do the speaking engagements. But, um, it, it is a little bit of a, a challenge logistically for sure. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of questions about the trek and I want to know what has been the best day and what's been the worst day. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, they're, they're good and bad in every day and it's for various different reasons. Um, I would say the worst day was every single day I was in the desert. <laughs> I tried to pick <laughs> just one, um, right. but from about Carson City, Nevada to like Grand Junction, Colorado, there's nothing out there. And so we would get to a town with like 5,000 people in it. And it was like going to New York City for the first time, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, I mean, there were there were days where at one point we went over a hundred miles between gas stations. And Mm -hmm. so we were having to make sure that we even had enough fuel in the RV to make it to the next place. And so I would say most of the days in the, in the desert were were the worst day. It's hard to kind of rank which one is the worst. I I climbed a 12,000 foot mountain in Colorado. That was a pretty bad day too. Mm -hmm. Um, The best days are the days I speak in the schools you know, the goal of this is to get this message out in kind of a new and and unique way. And so when I'm doing the running and we're posting online, of course, and doing conversations like this, but it's really when I get that face-to-face interaction with the kids and the parents and the teachers, um, that that's what really makes it all worth it to me. You know, when, when, they're able to share their stories and I'm able to, to share mine and, um, and, you know, do, do the work that's really important to me and, and what this mission is, is all about, because it is, it's about keeping these kids safe. This is not some vanity project that I just like, I just want to run across the country just to do it. Right. The ultimate goal is, um, to educate the kids, their parents, their teachers, and, you know, do advocacy work as well. Yeah. Okay. And I want to hear some of those stories that you're hearing in the schools and give some advice to parents. But first, can we talk about your backstory? What brought you here to the middle of Kansas running 120 marathons to keep kids safe online? The backstory is um, I, I was a kid growing up who did everything right. You know, good grades, college athlete, student council, double major, internships, high honors, everything that they told me growing up you were supposed to do to go out into the real world and get a good job. And so I work, I started working in politics in the state of Illinois right after college and, you know, political campaigns and things like that. And then I quickly got a job with um, the now former governor of Illinois to be his 
personal assistant. So traveling with him, preparing him for all of his appearances and so forth. Well, on my first day, some inappropriate social media posts that I'd made as a teenager five or six years before were unearthed, publicized, um, ended up being front page news in Chicago. I got fired from this job on my very first day. I'm literally in the car with the governor sitting right next to me as this story is breaking. Um, they made me actually... <laughs> You know, we're the we're doing events and that on this was literally my first day. And so we were doing these events and it was a press conference, one of the events. And so the media was going to be there. And they basically called me his PR person, the governor's and said, you know, he's the governor. You're a kid who who tweeted these inappropriate tweets and you're going to a press conference and we don't want you to be seen or photographed with the governor. So we literally pulled off the side of the highway and we stopped at this gas station and I had to get out of the official vehicle I was in with the governor, I had to get into like one of the other cars that were traveling with us. And so while he did the second event, I literally just sat there in the car (laughs) by myself. And so it was just a complete whirlwind. I mean, from Friday morning, I got the call to interview for this job, did the interview the same day. Sunday, they told me I got the job. Monday, I started and got fired. And Tuesday, it's on the front page of one of the largest newspapers in Illinois. And I'm a year out of college, right? After yeah. after everything that I had done right, none of that mattered. Yeah. Who who leaked them? Like, what? Ha- well, how did that happen? <laughs> well, um, what I've been told is it was an individual who worked for the same governor who I was going to work for, who got fired the week that I was getting hired and was upset about that. They created a fake uh, Twitter account, took these screenshots from my account. And look, I want to be clear, the posts were inappropriate, mm-hmm. but they were also five years old. It was five posts out of 5,000. They were jokes that were taken out of context, right? Like yeah, that's what totally. it was. Yeah. And so anyway, they created a fake account and they posted these screenshots and tagged the Chicago and Illinois political reporters. And so that's yeah. how it all came to be is through this right. fake account. And, right. you know, it's like, so, you know, when I go in these schools now, so much of the the cyber bullying and, and look, I'm not a victim. I was an adult, it, you know, but yeah. the same types of things happen in basically every school in America because I mm-hmm. hear these stories every day related to the fake accounts and the anonymous apps. And and that that newspaper used as their source was this fake Twitter account. Right. So how mm-hmm. does it not encourage more of the same? And yeah. so and, and ironically, Nikki, um, <laughs> Some of the very reporters that reported on this story, they had their own social media posts that were frankly worse than mine. I mean, they would make mine look PG. And so, and I had had those and, and have them in have for seven years. And so I had a decision to make. I can either post their posts. They will, they would have been fired from their job. There's no doubt about it. Most of them have deleted since deleted their posts in the time since. Sure. Um, but in 2017, there wasn't the understanding that, you know, that, that somebody could go back years and get you fired and things like that. And, you know, sensibilities change, people change. And, but anyway, these people had their own posts on their own accounts that were just as bad, if not worse than mine. And so I had a decision to make. Do I post their post? Do I get them fired from their job? Is I, that's what would have happened. Or, do I try and turn it into something good and, mm-hmm. you know, speak, share my story and, and hopefully something positive um, will come from that. And uh, looking back now, seven years later, um, a lot of positive has come from it. But it, it was just a kind of a whirlwind of, of emotions, right? This high of getting this great yeah. job to losing it immediately. Yeah, it could be a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the lesson, I mean, that and what what I think about is kids these days, they put all kinds of crazy things online and they, they're they anonymous. They think they're anonymous. They think on Snapchat, everything goes away and disappears. And that's coming back to bite them in the ass in a lot of ways, especially with when it comes to nude imagery, but a lot of the cyberbullying and inappropriate content. Um, and so what do you tell, like, what's that lesson for kids? What do you share to kids when you speak about this specifically? 
Well, you know, when I first started doing this, I thought the worst thing that could happen was getting fired from a job and getting your picture on the front page of the newspaper. And then I started going in these schools and I started hearing the cyberbullying and the body image issues and the online predators. And this was 2018 when when I started doing this. And so uh, there wasn't the research out there now. Jonathan Haidt's book wasn't out, right? There, there wasn't, we didn't know what we know now. And so I was, so much of this was anecdotal evidence. And I was like, why is no one talking about this, right? So that's why I've continued to, um, you know, to share my story and, um, you know, and of course, hear these, hear these stories from, from kids every single day. And it's just so heartbreaking when you realize what these kids are dealing with and that so many times they don't know who to talk to about it. They feel like they can't go to their, their mom or their dad or their, you know, their counselor at school. And so, um, that's, you know, just the most heartbreaking things you can imagine. And what I would say to parents is however bad you think it is, it's worse, um, in terms of what these kids are, are exposed to online. Um, and for some reason, it still seems that the kids are getting access to phones and social media at younger and younger ages, even though there seems to be more of an understanding that this stuff is, is not great for kids. So, um, it, it I do struggle with, kind of squaring those two things with one another. People are still giving their kids devices younger and younger and still defaulting to Apple devices, which are not safe for kids when now we have options for safer devices. But I'm leaning more towards just delaying any device, even a watch. I think that there's really important lessons right to be had in your kid being disconnected and learning life skills like learning how to walk to school and maybe you fall down or maybe you whatever, get lost. Like you have to talk to strangers and which is the stranger danger thing is not real. Like we're the world outside is safer than it ever was before. What's the, where the dangers lie is on the devices that you give them to keep them safe. Right. Right. Um, Well, I want to hear some stories. Like, is there anything that you've heard on this during this time, during this trek from students or parents at these schools that has kind of stuck with you? Nothing new in terms of the stories I hear because I've just been hearing them for six years. And unfortunately, very few of them shock me right. anymore. Um, mm-hmm. You know what I've heard from the kids, though, it, it put, you know, what what they share with me about running across the country and is mm-hmm. they've been saying to me, it's nice to see somebody who's made a mistake and who's like turning it into to something good. And so, you know, while I have these grandiose ideas, I think we all do of like, you know, let's pass laws to keep these kids safe and let's educate every parent in America and let's go on all, you know, every outlet we can get on and get this message out. It's like if one kid who's made a mistake can look at my experience and what I've turned it into and realize that, you know, this guy, this happened when he was a teenager, he made this mistake and now seven years, you know. 12 years after I posted those, but seven years after getting fired, you know, I have the benefit of, um, you know, a little bit of distance from it and a little bit of maturity and, um, perspective and reflection. And hopefully they see that. And several kids have made that comment, um, that it's just nice to see somebody turn it into, to something positive because to these kids, if they make a mistake and they all have, right. It seems like the biggest thing in the world at that time. And how do you get beyond it? And that's what I would say to parents is it's so different than when most of these parents were growing up when if you said or did something that was wrong, it Mm -hmm. went away pretty quickly. Whereas today, if a teenage girl has her nude photos passed around, she knows someone out there still has that photo, no matter what punishment may have been paid. Um, same thing with the, the fake accounts, the anonymous apps, a kid who's bullied, you know, they, the family and the kid, they work through that. And that, but still in the back of their head, they know that fake account could reemerge at any given moment. And I think there is a lot of anxiety that comes with that, with the kids, but also with, with their parents who have, who have dealt with that, um, you know, alongside them. Yeah. And you know, teenagers, I'm realizing because my daughter's turning nine in a couple of days and she's already acting like the smallest thing is like the biggest drama in the world. And I want to be like, that is so silly. Like, this is not something you should be upset about. But I have to be like, okay, to her, it's a big deal. And so these kids, especially when their their whole world is online and then something goes wrong, that can feel devastating and feel like the end of the world. And so we have to not brush it off if our kid is upset especially if it's something that seems silly when it comes to these online spaces. I think we got to be 
um, sensitive to their feelings around that. You had mentioned that passing laws to get kids protected online, which seems obvious, is like a grandiose idea. And after doing this for about a year, I'm I'm realizing how difficult that is. And yep. so what have you learned about the protections that our government provides our kids or doesn't um, online? Well, the government doesn't protect, provide protections for your kids. So there's that. Getting them to do so is a extremely slow and tedious process that frankly, may never happen. I, I hope it does. Um, but I, I would say to parents, you can't rely on an elected official or a social media company or a video game to keep your kids safe. Okay. As it stands currently, it's up to parents and the kids themselves, right? The kids need to be educated on these topics. And frankly, I think that's missing a lot in this space is yes. why, why is no one talking? I mean, I am, and I know a few others are, but like, at the end of the day, the kid is the one with the device in their hand there mm -hmm. and they can get around any parental restriction that their parents set up. So we have to start there with educating the kids and educating the parents. And then I, I believe the next steps are, you know, holding these companies feet to the fire, uh, trying to pass legislation. Um, but I think it's very important to start with the education piece. And that's why I focused on that. I know that I can go into a school and I can make a difference for kids and their parents and their teachers every single day. Whereas I, I feel much less um, return on investment of, of my time and energy and effort when I'm talking to a congressman or a state yeah. senator or state representative. Um, it, the, and, and then, you know, ev even if they do pass a law, that that law, whatever it is, they they will be sued. That state will be sued. Um, and these companies will come out and they will say, we are for this. We'll roll out these parental controls and do all these things. And then they'll send the net choice group in to file these lawsuits. And th publicly, they're saying this, but behind the scenes, they're they're actively fighting. And so these companies are not negotiating in good faith. None of them. Any elected official who's being honest would say the same thing. And then, you know, and then, you know, members of Congress, of course, are, are lobbied. I think um, they spent like big tech $30 million last year or lobbying members of Congress. Uh, the Kids Online Safety Act, um, as far as I can tell, isn't isn't going anywhere quickly. And part of the reason for that is that, you know, these the leadership in the in the Republican caucus, somebody coming who I worked for a Republican governor and I worked for the Republican Party. OK, so um, this isn't like I'm not on the right. you know, I, I'm a single issue voter at this point. Right. Some people vote on abortion or guns or what have you. And this is my issue now. And this is mm -hmm. how I, you know, view elected officials. You're either for or against keeping kids safe. And so, you know, the Republican leadership has taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from the big tech companies. And so simultaneously, they're refusing to meet with the families um, who have lost children to social media harms. And so, you know, we have 11 names on the back of this RV as I run across the country. And all 11 of those families are for the Kids Online Safety Act. They're for all these pieces of legislation. And mm -hmm. knowing these families personally who are texting me every morning, good luck with your run. You're doing great. We love what you're doing. Um, and to just see that the, these these elected officials won't even meet with them is is heartbreaking and and I just, I, I just never understand that. So um, again, that's kind of why I've decided to to spend the vast majority of my time and effort on on the education piece of it. Yeah, it's been interesting watching this play out legislatively. I am getting a crash course, but the thing that catches me up is these families. A lot of them who've lost children, they did all the things. They m protected their kids through monitoring. They had all the conversations. They delayed devices, and yet their their child was still killed or harmed by social media. So parents can do all of those things and their kid is still going to be harmed. So what is the answer here? Because we need to have the social media companies not serving suicide content to children in an algorithm. They're like, what do we do? I think it's a comprehensive approach that, that requires everyone at the table, right? And it's, it's the, it's the education of the kids. It's educating the parents. It's having policies in place in every school related to can the kids have phones? And I would say that the answer to that is no, but right. there's nuance with that too, is, you know, with somebody has to enforce that. And so mm -hmm. a lot of schools struggle with that and, you know, having 
Um, you know, maybe it's not the best idea to give kindergartners and first graders iPads and Chromebooks. And, you know, what, maybe what not, is that? Ben, maybe not. <laughs> what, what, what does that, you know, what does that look like from the school's perspective? And now with AI, I mean, kids can voice clone their teachers. And, um, you know, there, we, we've had kids who've called themselves out of school using an AI voice cloner. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, all kinds of crazy things that, you know, and so they should have an AI policy in place and, you know, the AI generated nude images. I mean, they should have something in their school policy saying you can't use the name, image and likeness of a anyone who's part of that school community. And mm -hmm. so there's there's that part of it. And then, it, of course, is the companies themselves. They should not be hosting and serving uh, this type of content to to yeah. really anyone, but most especially you kids and then the uh, you know the the legislative side of things as well i don't think any one of those things is going to do it on on its own right it's yeah. it's it's all of them together and it still may not solve all of these issues um but there, there's no way i don't think to you, you can't regulate your way out of this problem right you can't legislate yourself out of this problem not that's important, but that in and of itself will not be enough, right? And you can't just educate the parents because the kids still know all the workarounds. And so mm -hmm. for every everything you and I can talk about all day long about set up, you know, use this app and, and monitor them this way, do this, this, and this. Yeah. There's also a TikTok video out there telling that kid how to get around that parental <laughs> restriction, right? So yeah. it, it, I, I think it takes all of us and, um, you know, a, a a lot of different people at the table and hitting it from every angle possible. Okay. Yeah. And when it comes to parents, if, if I'm a parent and I'm like, I got to get educated on the, the harms of the, the internet for my child, what are like just briefly the few things that I should be looking up and educating myself on when it comes to the harms of social media? Well, I think they should probably listen to this podcast. I mean, it's the, it's the best. I mean, truthfully, Nikki, it is the best one that's out there. And I just want to commend you on, you know, what you've built this into in, in a really a short amount of time. Um, this is the best for parents. And I, I've been telling parents um, in my presentations, you know, you should you should follow Nikki's podcast um, because it is the best and most comprehensive information that's out there. And it's it's in as close to real time as possible. You know, so many times an article comes out and then three weeks later, there's a, somebody sends out an email blast. It's like, by the time parents find out about it, the, it's, there's already a new issue, yeah, right? right? So right. Um, I, I think they should be plugged into to people like you. Um, and that, you know, as far as actionable steps they can take, um, mm -hmm. I would say making sure there's always open communication with the kids. These kids tell me things every day that a lot of times they haven't told their their parents before. And it's the personal story, but it's also telling these kids, look, if you find yourself in a dangerous situation, you're not alone. The adults can help you. And maybe your mom doesn't know everything about Snapchat and your counselor doesn't know everything about TikTok, but they know how to get you the help that you need if you find yourself in a dangerous situation. I think that's pretty good messaging on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think keeping devices out of the bedrooms at night is is smart and really really anything with access to the internet i don't think should be in a bedroom or a bathroom or um e you know we've dealt with a lot where um even a kid who doesn't have a phone is at a sleepover in a basement and you know one of the kids does have a phone and that can create some some dangerous situations and then mm -hmm. you know parental controls and you know but it's also the parents themselves showing a good example of what mm -hmm. responsible healthy tech looks like right because you know, if you, Nikki, if you ask me, summarize in one sentence what you've learned after six years of doing this, I would say, being totally honest, I think the parents are the problem. Popping in here to tell you about the best phone for kids, and that is the Bark phone. If you don't want your kids signing up for social media, an iPhone is not going to do it. They will find their way around the parental controls. The Bark Phone starter plan comes with talk and text only. If and when you're ready to start integrating social media access or more apps, there are advanced plans available that offer social media, but not without your approval. Plus, the Bark Phone has advanced content monitoring, which will send you alerts of potential dangers. If your child already has an iPhone or an Android and you don't want to switch it up, please layer on Bark parental controls as a baseline. You can set screen time rules, block certain websites and apps, get alerts, and a ton more helpful options for parents. Also, check out the brand new Bark Watch. Back to my chat with Ben Tracy. 
(laughs) Like that's honest. And I say that in my parent presentation because that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's for me, it's like freeing in a way because once you've got fired and they've like said a bunch of mean stuff about you already, you kind of like don't give a shit. (laughs) So it's like, it's like kind of freeing. Um, And so, um, you know, that, that's what I would say, say to parents is be mindful about the example that, that you're setting, because it's just like anything else. These kids are going to emulate the behavior of their role models. And when they see athletes and celebrities and politicians being unkind online, why are we shocked that they do the same thing? Yeah. So for adults, it's about not being on your phone the whole time when your kids are around, like putting it away in in another room if you need to. But when you do need to use it, I love the advice of narrating what you are doing, especially if you're using it as a tool to look something up or look up directions saying, I'm picking up my phone right now to look up this thing that will help our life, you know, like showing them telling them why. And then also it gets embarrassing when you're like, I'm picking up my phone right now just to look at Instagram for five minutes and zone out. Like, is that the best decision when your kid is in front of you? Probably not. Um, right. I agree. It does come down to communications and the relationship you have with your kid because you can restrict everything and they're still going to get access to, to these platforms on school issued devices, on their friend's device. They might sneak one. If you have an iPad in a drawer, like they will figure out how to get it charged up and connected to the internet. So it's about when they see suicide content, self-harm content, body dysmorphia, like when they see that, how are they going to handle it? Are they going to internalize it and will it affect them? Or are they going to know to talk to you about it, that they saw something strange? Um, Because are you prompting them? Are you that safe space? Or are they going to feel like they're in trouble because they saw that? Uh, or even if they sought it out, p- pornography, right? Like these kids are going to seek that kind of thing out and they have to know they're not going to be in trouble if they bring it to you and you're going to work together and teach them that that stuff exists and that we don't want to engage with it and why. Um, so yeah, the conversations are the most important thing. What else? Is there anything else that is really important for parents to know before we kind of start to close out here? No, I, th- I mean, I think we've, I think we, I mean, we of course could get into yeah, the I specifics of every real, single app yeah. and go, you know, yeah. we could go three hours long with that. And you know yeah. what I, what I tell parents is look, like if you, if your approach as a parent is I'm going to learn every feature of every app, that's, you'll always be not drinking realistic. from a fire hose, yeah. right? Like that's just not realistic. I mean, there, I think there's something like 3000 new apps added to the app store every single day. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. like that approach doesn't work. And so that's why the conversations are so important that, you know, creating a family tech agreement or, you know, something that spells out some of the rules and the consequences, or if you want to call them rules, right. But the, yeah. the rules and the consequences of breaking mm-hmm. those rules ahead of time and um, more kind of general guidelines for that family's use of technology um, as opposed to the specifics of every app that's out there. That's just not a winning formula, I don't believe, Mm -hmm. for for parents. I agree because they're also, these platforms are rolling out new functionality that makes it easier for them to hide things like Snapchat's uh, My Eyes Only, Data Vault. Like parents don't know that they're, and they won't know unless they had a pin to find things there. And all the apps have secrets, hiding spots. And app, even the iPhone just rolled out new hidden apps feature. So it's just, um, yeah, I agree that that's not the best approach and that treating it like a, a car that you let your child drive, that you they've had training to do. And they if they uh, misuse it and they drive unsafe, like they're going to lose access to it. I think that approach and whether, I mean, I wish there was like training provided with a with a device um but the parent might just need to provide that safety training up front before giving the device well right? well and there should be in school should be doing that too i mean our you know our mutual friend joanne bogard passed yeah. the law uh, mason's law in the state of indiana which yeah. requires digital citizenship online tra- uh, online safety education for mm-hmm public school students in the state of Indiana, why is every, why is every state not doing that? Right. I I mean, I think that's a a, a great thing. I mean, I think the average for teenagers is like 4.8 hours each day on social media apps. In what world would we do four, almost five hours of anything, uh, especially at that age and not have a whole lot of conversations and curriculum um, Mm -hmm. around that issue, whatever that issue is. Right. So um, I think that's another thing that could be done um, in in schools and, and, you know, crossover legislatively as well. 
Do you have any inkling why schools are kind of hesitant to take that on? Uh, I think some schools don't want to have difficult conversations. Um, I think there are, look, I mean, if you're a school administrator, um, especially in public schools, um, there's really not a whole lot of motivation to rock the boat, not a whole lot of motivation to um, introduce anything new. Um, they, so many school administrators, and I, look, I work with them, so, and most of the ones I work with yeah. are great, um, right. but some of them do act like politicians where they're scared of their own shadow, they're scared of any pushback, they're scared of doing anything, anything new, even if they know it's the right thing to do. There's no principle in America who, who doesn't know that this stuff is bad for kids. Like no principal is going to say more of my kids should have iPhones, more of my kids should be on TikTok and Snapchat. Nobody's saying that, but mm -hmm. same with the parents. Like how does that knowledge, why is that not translating to mm -hmm. action? And I think, you know, when you talk about issues of sextortion and suicide and some of these difficult, heavy topics, they don't want to introduce kids. You know, the argument that a lot of them make is, well, I don't want to introduce the kids to something that they don't already know about. Yeah. The, if they're on these apps and I go in schools every day, even in a third to fifth, I ask how many of you have smartphones and it's 60 to 70% of them. And so they are well aware of what these issues are. And, you know, I, I think there are there's language that, you know, you don't talk to a third grader about this stuff the same way you do with a senior in high school. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, the knowledge and terminology increases over time. Um, yeah. But, you know, what I what I tell parents is somebody's going to have this conversation with your kid and it's either going to be the parent or the school who, you know, has the values you want the kid to have. Yeah. Or it's going to be somebody else on the Internet who probably has different values than than what your family has. Yeah. And so I would recommend to parents to have these conversations as early as possible because mm -hmm. these kids come up to me and they say things to me. And, you know, I just look at them and it's like, what? You, how do you know this? How do you know these things that I learned in in college? How do you know that in fifth grade? Yeah. And I used to just be heartbroken by that, but I've realized and, you know, I wish it were different, but they are going to learn it at an age that none of us, frankly, are comfortable with. And so they should learn it from the people who love them and care about them, not mm -hmm. somebody else on TikTok. Right. <clears throat> and I, in my experience, my school district is not doing a great job proactively informing and educating kids about these issues. You may have seen a video I posted last week. My principal wanted to put a picture of my daughter on Instagram and told my daughter, you're going to be Insta famous. So just the lack of awareness that that's not something my daughter should want to be. And right. she's eight. So also can't, shouldn't be posted. Also, why is the school posting kids on social media? Anyway, but that principal is so disconnected from what the harms are. Yeah. And I think it's totally reasonable for the, for yeah. the parents who do understand this and are actively engaged. It's totally reasonable to ask your school what they're doing to educate your kids, what devices the kids have access to during the day. If you don't know um, how they're filtering and monitoring what's going on on those devices, um, what their tech policy is, if they have an AI policy, those are all fair questions that, that parents who are engaged with this should be asking their school administrators. 100%. And I have a document on my website that's seven questions to ask your school, but I'm working on some way more resources around this because this is a huge problem. And there are a bunch of stakeholders trying to help throughout the country. So um, listeners, keep an eye out for more resources around making school tech safer. Yeah. So where can listeners connect with you and follow Tracy Trek? So tracytrek.com is the website. Um, ben J. Tracy on Instagram. We're kind of, Nikki, you've seen it, kind of the day-to-day -day happenings of, yeah, of huh? life on the road, running yeah. across the country. It's it's super interesting. Um, and we just, you know, we just take it one day at a time. So yeah. um, we'd love to, love to have you follow. And, you know, we're kind of trying to mix in the, you know, some fun stuff and entertaining stuff while also the educational stuff too. And, you know, that's, that was half the reason behind this, Nikki, is, you know, it's like you go to these schools and you get you get parents like Nikki Reesberg to show up who are like invested in this stuff. But we we all I think all of us in this space, we want to reach those those other parents who can't make it to a speaking engagement. And they themselves are at home scrolling on Instagram. Right. Because it does seem a little hypocritical to say, you know, all these things, these apps are all bad. 
also follow me on Instagram is like a weird, it's like a weird transition to make. Um, and it does seem a little hypocritical. Yeah. Um, but I realized those are the parents who most need to hear this stuff. And so thank heavens there are, there are people like you, um, doing what you're doing and that, you know, similar goal with, with this is maybe if I run across the country with my shirt off and like, you know, eat Uncrustables and gas station pizza and like, maybe, maybe we can get some parents to care who didn't before. I don't know. Yeah. So we'll see. I love it. And I bought your sweatshirt. So what is this? I love like? it. Kids are, kids are cool. Keep them safe. And it's, I think it says keep kids safe online or something on the back. But every time I wear this out, someone says, oh, that's so cool. Like more than anything else I've ever worn. <laughs> so I love it. People really appreciate it. So I don't know, check out the merch because it's really comfortable and cool. And uh, also the Instagram has been really fun to follow along. And you guys are working in some like humor and fun, like guy stuff. So it's been (laughs) Um, But you guys are amazing. You and the team on Tracy Track. So thank you so much for doing this and for amplifying these messages and the families who have been harmed and the children who have been lost. Um, I wish you were coming through my town, but uh, please go to tracytrack.com and see where you guys are going to stop next. What's the last day or what's like the dead, deadline? So, I, for? yeah, I finish um, around December 20th in Ocean City, Maryland. And so my route is Highway 50 across the country. I'm currently um, outside this this town called Newton, Kansas. And so I'll be in Kansas City in about a week and then, you know, maybe a week or 10 days after that, St. Louis. And then it goes through Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana. Cincinnati up through DC uh, early, you know, early to mid December. And then, like I said, finish in Ocean City, Maryland. Okay. Amazing. Thank you, Ben. Thank yeah, you for doing that. Thanks anything. for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks for taking the time.